Hello and welcome to Freya's Tropical Garden. There's a heat wave down here on the south coast of England at the moment so I hope you're all keeping yourselves hydrated. Now coming up on today's episode. When do you give up on a plant and when do you keep trying and hoping it'll come back? I interview Connie Venus about the plants that she grows in her home. I visit the big plant nursery and take you around on a tour. We take a closer look at the plant Persicaria microcephala. What is mosaic virus and what do you do if you have it? And there's another chance to look at my video on how to grow oyster mushrooms. But first, let's take a look at what's changed in my garden since the last episode. A few of my morning glories have started to flower now. This is a variety called Party Dress and it's flowering a lot earlier than the other varieties I've got. I also have some lilies flowering. I'm not exactly sure which variety this is as I've had it many years. But this is a variety called Claude Shride and it's a lovely type of lily. You can also see the red hot poker there flowering. You may have seen this one before if you follow my photo of the days on social media. My canna patterns is growing well and even that started flowering now. This variety has a stunning yellow and red flower. This stachys, which is commonly known as lamb's ear, is a wonderful plant to put in any sensory garden. And if you're looking to plant things for bees, the bees absolutely love this. This daybreak red gazania is a new variety for me this year. And I must say, I often forget the oxalis triangularis is here because later it gets covered by jungle foliage. All my voodoo lilies have flowered now. Unfortunately, these flowers only last for a day or two. But I was particularly excited to see the Dracunculus flower this year because this is the first time I've seen this one flower and it did not disappoint. Just to give you an idea for size reference, I've just put my hand in this picture just to show you how big this flower actually is. The leaves on this variety will die back soon. However, on the Sauromatum, the leaves are just starting to come out. I showed you in the last episode how my sunflowers were starting to recover from slug damage. They've got a lot taller now and are even starting to produce some flower buds. Most of the varieties I've sown are reds and chocolate colours. And in my last episode I divided one of my Musabazju bananas which you can see is now unfurling a leaf and has settled in nicely. This canna is a variety called Russian Red which will grow six foot tall by the end of this summer. While at the back here you can see a leaf has now opened up on my alocasia, which if you've been following my videos you'll know I actually overwintered this outdoors this year and it survived. I do seem to be able to get away with overwintering a lot of things outdoors. And another example is this colocasia called coal miner, which I've also just left in the ground over winter and you can see is now starting to come back. This is its third year, but the first it's had hard frosts in winter. And these shoots look like the Colocasia Jack's Giant is starting to re-emerge as well. I've had this one four years as it was the only one to survive my first attempt at overwintering by dry storing. And this is one of the factors that started me trying to leave things in the ground. This Hymenocallus, or spider lily, was actually left in the ground by accident a couple of years ago. And my understanding was that it was not hardy at all. And yet even after these hard frosts, it's still come back again. Now, I mentioned in my last video that I've been leaving a few buttercup weeds in the ground for the pollinators. But when I removed one this week, I discovered that this begonia rex that I'd left in the ground over winter has actually survived. This is another plant that I've always assumed was just a house plant, so I did not expect it to survive. And a few of my dahlias are starting to emerge now. Both new ones that I've planted and some of the old ones that I've left in the ground over winter are starting to come back. And I'm just giving them a little bit of extra protection against slugs because the new leaves aren't quite vulnerable. Now I mentioned in the last episode that I was a bit worried that my tetrapanics may have lost some size last year. However, you can see these leaves are definitely starting to get nice and big. So I don't think I've got anything to worry about there. And I'd also taken some mimosa cuttings because I was a little bit worried about the health of the main plant. Unfortunately, none of these cuttings have taken... However, the good news is that the plant does look like it's starting to recover now, so hopefully I haven't got anything to worry about there either. My Acer has started to produce some seeds, and this is the first time that I've actually seen this on this tree. But you can see here that these seeds are this lovely, pretty pink helicopter shape, which will later fall to the ground in autumn. And if you've seen my previous video on pollarding the Paulonia tomentosa, you'll know that I cut all the old branches off. So you can see now there's quite a lot of foliage that is regrowing from it. And this is the point at which I cut the top off. And you can see that what's grown on top of that now is probably at least two foot tall already.
Next, we're gonna take a look at how you can tell which plants to give up on and which ones might still come back. In spring, even after most of our plants have come back to life, it can still seem sometimes like we've got a lot of dead sticks sticking out of the ground. And therefore it can be tempting to give up on them and dig them up and discard them. Now I've seen a few people commenting that their salvias have come back and urging people not to give up. As you can see on this one, the base of it is still green. Now quite simply, as long as the wood is still green, it's still alive and therefore new shoots can form. But it's not always clear from the outside of the wood whether it's still green inside. So if this is the case, you can scrape away a small section of the outside of the wood and that will reveal the wood within, which you can see here is still green. This one is also a salvia. They seem to be a bit late coming back this year, but don't give up just yet. My Bugmansia, on the other hand, straight away you can see that this has a hole running through the wood, which is never a good sign and the wood is white and brittle and snaps easily. So I've cut this plant now about halfway down the stem just to take a look at how the wood's looking further down. And you can see the hole is still there. Last year this plant did reshoot from about this point. However, this winter has had much worse frosts so it does seem to have taken its toll on this plant this year. So I keep taking it back further and further hoping to find that point where that wood is still good. And you can see near the bottom here that there is no longer a hole in it. The wood is still green on the outside and it's nice and white and fresh in the middle. It's no longer brittle and hopefully this plant will still shoot from the bottom. I may have lost a bit of height on this plant this year but it should grow back in no time. You may have already seen the short video I did on my cordylines. And this video shows once again the comparison between the dead wood on one side of the section and the live wood on the other side as I cut it down lower. So I'm hoping this cordyline can still shoot from the bottom although there's no signs of any growth yet. And with this section, you can once again see that telltale hole, which shows that the wood has died. And you can see the comparison here from the dead wood to the live wood to see what you're looking for. The top section of this yucca has definitely died back. I'm not entirely sure about the bottom section of wood at the moment, but you can see that it has sprouted from the ground. And of course, some plants like dahlias won't shoot back from the wood. They will shoot from under the ground. So if you're ever in any doubt, please don't give up on your plants until at least July. And some plants can sulk for even longer than that. And in fact, since making that video, my salvias have already started to grow again. You can see here the green shoot at the bottom. And this Brugmansia has finally got going. Next, I'm going to visit one of my favourite local gardeners, Connie Venus, and we're going to take a look at the plants that she grows. So today I'm here in Hailing Island with Connie. Connie is a local gardener and she's here to talk to us about some of the plants that she grows. So Connie, please, can you tell us how you first got into gardening? Right. I always loved gardening, but since 2003, I went to many of these National Trust holidays, they call it gardening holiday. You actually pay for it and you work for free, but you see the most amazing gardens, meet um, people who have the same tick like I have, and you always learn new things. Like in Trillis, the gardener showed us how to brew and how it drains us. In Hitcoat Gardens, which is one of my favorite ones, they showed us how to take cuttings and on it goes. So I did this for a long time till I hurt my back. <laughs> and then I had to slow down a bit. Which, which plant do you find the most difficult to propagate? Hmm, the most difficult I think is the tetrapanax because you can only use root cuttings. You have to disturb actually your mother plant, cut into the roots, hope that a little pup comes up and then 50% chance it takes or not takes doesn't like to be separated from the mother mm -hmm. but all the other plants like salvias they are so much easier we bought the propagator which sprays water warm water from underneath the cuttings i find that the best and easiest method to have good results otherwise i don't use rooting powder or whatsoever just shady place a bag over the top and it does the trick and is that the method you use for most of the plants that yes. you grow? Yes. Yeah. 
You sell a lot of plants on Facebook Marketplace, which is how I first came to, to come across you. Um, so can you tell us how you got started doing that? Yeah, that's funny because originally I went to garden shows like Stansted Park and so on and always had to go out every every other weekend to little private gardens to sell plants. But then came COVID. Right. Sad time. But on the other hand, I had to find a different way to sell plants. And that's how I came across Facebook and realized people actually come to you buy the plants, get some advice, see how it does in the garden, the plant that I want to grow, so it's actually much better. I like it. And you meet lots of people. On your Facebook page you talk about collecting quite a lot of unusual plants. Uh, what sort of unusual plants do you have in your garden? Hmm, where do I start? I love ginger lilies. Um, for instance, ginger lily greeny eye, that's that one, which has lovely dark leaves underneath, big orange flowers, and it actually is the best one to propagate. Do I have yes, one yes. left? One there also. Where? Ah, here. Can you see on the old flower stem, if you don't cut it down, you get little pups. And only that ginger lily, as far as I know, does it. Right. Then we have pugmansias or anxious trumpets which some people call Datura, but it's actually not. Pugmansia is perennial, Datura is annual. Uh, all are a bit poisonous if you smoke it or eat it, but just don't and then you're fine, because I have them for 35 years and I'm still alive. There's another new plant I have. If you need something for the shade, that's the Tartubium. Much easier, the common name is leopard plant likes a bit moist and shade and then it's happy. I love it. But I have also many different unusual uh, salvias like the salvia baselii has the most amazing big orange flowers and grows to about five foot. Uh, and it looks, the leaves look like that and has nice dark stems. Obviously it's not in flower yet, it's too early. And I've just bought this one off you, so uh, yeah. I'll be looking forward to growing that one in my garden this year. <laughs> or oh, then on my National Trust holidays, you worked for free, but you could always um, have seeds or cuttings. So I got a fuchsia splendens, which I love very much. Uh, I grew echiums in all colors, including the white pretty eye, which is the red one from Tenerife. Um, we have one in the garden in flower, a white one, which is probably over three meters. Yeah, as the list is endless. Voodoo lilies, yeah. you know as well. Yeah. <laughs> so Martin Venosum. I have a plant from Mexico, another shade-loving plant, if you see. It has lovely velvety leaves, which is only the start of it and it grows to about two meters flowers in the middle of the winter as it comes from the other side of the world it's senetio petasitis but it's actually hardy now you've got your first open day coming up next weekend uh, unfortunately by the time this video comes out that will already have happened however if you could tell us a little bit about what you're planning so that perhaps people can keep an eye out for your future events okay it's actually this weekend already, the Saturday, the 3rd of June, between 2 and 6 p.m. It's the first time for this garden, because we've only been in that garden since 2018. But I think we transformed it to something exciting to look at. So I want people to see it. They can come, they can have a cup of tea or whatever, and wander around, buy some plants, and enjoy themselves. And by the way, Ray, this is my unpaid slave because I couldn't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. So all the digging, hedge cutting, boring grass mowing is up to him. He's good at that. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much to Connie and to Ray for showing me around your wonderful garden and for taking the time out to talk to us. I've got some beautiful plants that I'll be planting in my garden. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to know more about the plants that Connie sells or about her open days, you can find her on Facebook. 
Her Facebook page is Plants from Venus. And as well as Coddy's plants, I've had some other plants in the last fortnight. I've got this cornus from Jay Parks today, and this is a plant that should be stunning when it flowers. And I've also had a delivery from Toucan Tropicals. This plant arrived earlier in the week, and it is a type of ruum called Ruum Alexandrea. And Toucan Tropicals can be found on eBay or through Facebook via David Rumbold. And in addition to this, I've also been to B&M, where I've managed to pick up this lovely yucca, a phoenix canariensis palm tree and a celosia. And a visit to a local garden centre yielded a callistamon, a calla lily and a replacement lily for one that hasn't come back this year. Next up, I'm taking you on a trip round the big plant nursery. The Big Plant Nursery is one of several online retailers that I use to buy my tropical plants from. However, it's the only one that's located close enough for me to visit regularly. So whether you're planning a visit yourself, or you live too far away and would like a better idea of what it's like, I decided to film my recent visit so I could share it with you. The Big Plant Nursery was founded in 1999 by Bruce Jordan, a garden designer who specialised in exotic gardens. From small beginnings, eventually the company grew to the point where they are exhibiting in many shows across the country. They even managed to win a gold medal at Hampton Court. For those who are able to visit, the nursery is open seven days a week and has a tea room. And if you're not able to get here in person, most of their plants are able to be delivered across the whole of the UK. There's plenty of staff at hand to deliver advice on plant care and growing tips. And personally, I just love walking around and browsing the many plants that they've got for sale, getting inspiration for my garden. Which, of course, is harder to do when you're looking online at the websites. Not all of the plants you see here are for sale, like this larger insette and a few that aren't ready yet. I should probably point out that this is not an advert and I have not been paid to do this video. When I review products and companies, I am basing it just on my own experiences. I have seen some recent comments online about cannavirus. However, my advice here would be the same as for any retailer, which is to avoid shopping online for them and make sure you can see the plant in person. There is no sign of virus on these plants. I absolutely love this Xantheria and was very tempted to buy this as well as one of these Brahia Amatas. However, I don't have enough space in my car today. And if you do visit the big plant nursery, you might not want to bring children with you just so you've got that extra space in your car. So I hope you found it useful being able to have a look around the big plant nursery and see for yourself what it looks like. And for me today, I've just contented myself with buying three plants. This striking Cordyline Australis Pico. This lovely variegated ginger dancing crane. And of course a new tree fern. My only tree fern at the moment hasn't got any height on it at all, so it's nice to have one that's a little bit more up off the ground now. I've planted my ginger into the new bed that I'm trying to fill out at the moment, by the aces. And the cordial line has replaced an insette that didn't make it through winter. Next, we're going to be taking a look at one of my favourite plants, the Persicaria. Persicaria microcephala is from a family of plants known as knotweeds. This is not to be confused with Japanese knotweed, which is highly invasive. Persicaria is not considered to be an invasive species, but it is very easy to grow. Personally, I love growing Persicaria red dragon because these big patches of red foliage really help to break up the lush green of the tropical garden. It will also grow in pretty much any soil type and in sun or in shade. And although it will die back to the ground in winter, it will come back thicker and stronger in spring. I now also have this variety called Purple Fantasy, which I'm looking forward to growing this year. And I planted it alongside my red dragon so that the leaf colours will complement each other. Now this is a very fast growing plant and last week I took this video to show how it's already starting to spill over onto my path. And then I've taken this video a week later and you can see just how much it's grown in that time. So I'm going to be cutting this back today, which also happens to give me a very good opportunity to take some cuttings. Now normally when I'm cutting this back, I would just take it back to the edge of the path. 
However, this has grown so big that it has fallen to the ground under the weight of it. So I'm going to take this right back. And you don't need to worry about cutting this back too harshly because it will grow back again very quickly. So now that I've finished cutting, you can see that it looks a lot tidier and it will, like I said, it will grow back very fast and soon we'll have a lovely lush clump of red again. Now, the only reason I'm not doing this at the moment with my other two clumps is because it is flowering at the moment. So I'm going to give it a chance to finish flowering before I cut them back. And as I said earlier, I'm using those bits that I've just cut off to create some cuttings. And it is so easy to propagate with cutting, so use whichever method you prefer. I'm going to propagate this one in water, so I'm going to make the cut below a leaf node, and then remove all the lower leaves. I also cut the remaining leaves in half just to reduce the amount of water lost through the leaves. And then I'm going to be rooting mine in a bottle of water. This water will need to be changed every day or two, and put on a windowsill out of direct sunlight. And then probably within a week you should start to see roots forming. This is one that I did previously, which is now rooted very nicely, and so I've potted this one up. And now this will form a new plant in no time at all. Now I've cut so much of this persicaria back today that I've actually decided to put it all together in a vase here for some foliage. And I've added a couple of stems of my climbing white rose just to give it a bit more interest. So I'm curious to see if I can get a few of these to root. Now, unfortunately, this week I've spotted a disease called mosaic virus in one of my arum lilies. So my next video is going to take a look at how you can spot this virus and what to do if one of your plants is affected. This week I discovered signs of the dreaded mosaic virus in one of my arum lilies. You can see here the telltale signs in the leaves of discoloration. This is not a genetic variance. Mosaic virus would ultimately be fatal to the plant, but it's especially important to remove it early before it spreads to other plants. This virus can be spread by aphid, but also by tools, so it's really important to disinfect your tools after using. I've also had to dig around in the soil to make sure I've got up all the bits of rhizome so that this plant does not reproduce. In the meantime, I now have to keep a very close eye on my other arum lilies to make sure that they haven't also been infected. You can see here discoloration on this leaf. However, it's not the same as the discoloration from the mosaic virus. And in this case, it's likely to be lack of nutrients or possibly not enough water. So I've now made sure I've given this plant a really good seaweed feed. Just to make it clear, I've put the pictures side by side so that you can see the mosaic virus in the top. Now, I will not be able to plant another arum lily in this location because the virus will remain in the soil. And I'm actually not going to plant anything in this location this year because I'm not entirely sure what the risks are of transmission to other plants that may be susceptible to mosaic virus. So I'm just going to play it safe and leave this patch of ground empty this year. If you've had experience of mosaic virus, please share your experiences in the comments. Of course, once you start looking for the signs of virus, then you're looking for it everywhere. This canna, for example, Canna Cleopatra, has some distinctive markings in the leaf. Canna virus is just one of the many viruses that we need to look out for as gardeners. And discoloration of the leaves is usually the first sign. Look at how the streaks come through the red part here. However, in cannas, all new leaves come through looking a little bit like this. And you can see now a week later as it moves on, those colours are looking much stronger and bolder. And you can see that there is no sign of virus. This canna tropicana gold looks suspect. But until it's got its proper leaves through, all I can do is wait for the next leaf to come through. And finally today, there's another opportunity to see my previous video on how to grow oyster mushrooms. Now I've never done this before so I've ordered a starter kit from Sonia Cherry Smoke and this contains a bag of straw, grain spawn, a face mask, gloves, unicorn bag, two ties, a misting bottle and a set of instructions. If you're interested in ordering one of these kits yourself I've put a link to Sonia's Facebook in the description for this video. Firstly it's important to make sure you're wearing the gloves and the face mask at all times to avoid contamination. Step 1 is to pasteurise the straw by pouring boiling hot water from a kettle and leaving for a couple of hours until it's cooled. Drain the straw, squeezing it to get all the moisture out, and then mix in the grain spawn, breaking it up to distribute evenly amongst the straw. Fill up the unicorn bag provided, making sure you pack it all down tightly. 
and then use one of the plastic ties provided to tie up the top of the bag. Place in a black bin liner, keeping it loose so that air can flow around it, and then store it somewhere warm and dark for about two weeks. This one actually ended up taking three and a half weeks before it was fully colonised, and you can see now that it is all turned white. Next, you just need to put four slits in about two or three centimetres long with a sharp knife, and then place it somewhere that is warm, moist and bright. I put mine in my grow tent. And after that, it was only about a week before I started seeing little mushrooms forming, and a few days later, they were growing very rapidly and ready to eat. Now, I have a new group that I formed on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook and you want the opportunity to ask questions or share your gardens, then please do join. It's called Freya's Tropical Garden. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thank you ever so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please don't forget to leave your comments below because I really do value your feedback. And also, if you've enjoyed this content, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Don't forget, you can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and on my website.